just to review um, this band structure idea, we get these terms from semiconductors. You have intrinsic semiconductors that when you've got lots and lots of atoms, all of those molecular orbitals that we like to talk about with individual molecules, those molecular orbitals, uh, you have so many of them and they're bunched so close together that instead of talking about bonding and antibonding orbitals, we start talking about valence bands and conduction bands. And so when we move into solid materials, when you think about material science, this is how a lot of um, solid state physicists talk about that electronic structure of materials. And the energy difference between the valence band and the conduction band is the band gap. Um, and we look at intrinsic semiconductors like silicon, and that's how we compare the number of electrons um, for the dopants. And you can put in n-type dopants that are electron rich, and those raise the electron donor level, so it's closer to the conduction band. And you can put in p-type dopants that are electron poor that decrease and uh, incorporate lower acceptor levels that are closer to the valence band. And so those end up reducing the amount of energy that it takes to promote electrons into these bands. For a solid scintillator like sodium iodide doped with thallium, the thallium is electron poor, so that's a p-type, um, not semiconductor, but at least a p-type dopant um, into the sodium iodide. And those create little holes, which the electrons can migrate into. They fall into those, and when, then when they fall back down into the valence band, the light energy that they emit is not as likely to be absorbed by the crystal itself. And so that's how it works for when you have near instantaneous radiation depositing energy in the detector and light emission coming from the scintillation. So this is kind of like our excitation and fluorescence with our molecular fluorescence, okay? You can also have solid scintillators that do not emit that light right away. And so we have dosimeters that we typically use in the laboratory this is when you're exposed to relatively low levels of radiation. Again, these dosimeters might be collected every month or might be collected every quarter. And so they need to be able to sum up or kind of integrate all of the radiation dose that they've received. And there's two different methods for reading these dosimeters. And kind of the trick for these, so we have both thermoluminescent dosimeters and optically stimulated luminescent dosimeters. The thermolescent, thermoluminescent dosimeters are the ones that you might see in those black plastic cases. Um, those are the ones that have been used traditionally at Brookhaven National Lab. The optically stimulated luminescent dosimeters are the ones that you typically see more in say hospitals and academic settings. And they still rely on the same kind of valence and conduction band structure, but the way they work, the materials they're made out of, the dopants work a little bit differently in that the dopants actually trap the excited electrons. And the excited electrons that get trapped in these dopant levels um, have very poor probabilities of decay back to the ground state. So they're effectively trapped in this excited state. Okay, a thermoluminescent detector then re-excites those trapped electrons by heating your material and you can measure the amount of light that comes off of the heated material, okay? And that can be read by either photomultiplier tubes or diodes, and diodes are kind of uh, one of our upcoming topics today. The light that, um, if you're using an optically stimulated luminescent detector, you can shine light on that and that will re-excite those trapped electrons. You can tune that light so that it will only excite the trapped electrons and not the ground state electrons. Uh, those trapped electrons, they get excited back up to the valence band, or conduction band rather, and then they can finally fall back to the valence band. They have good probabilities for doing that. If they happen to fall back into a trapped level, then you're still shining that excitation light on there and so they get re-excited. And so over time, all of those electrons are gonna get excited back to the conduction band where they can fall all the way back down into the valence band. And when they do that, they emit light again 
There, this is basically the a fluorescence process, but the emitted light is gonna have a, a shorter wavelength. That's gonna be a higher energy than the excitation energy that, it, that excited the trapped electrons. And so this is an anti-Stokes shift because you're getting a higher energy out than what you put in, but really you're getting more energy out than you put in because you already put energy into the crystal in the form of the radiation when the dosimeter was exposed to whatever radioactive material radioactive material material you were working with um, and you may have heard about these stokes and anti stokes shifts if you've ever done any raman spectroscopy um, this makes these specific dosimeters basically delayed scintillators so you could think of it as phosphorescence where the lifetime for that phosphorescence, phosphorescence is so long that they're effectively not emitting any light until you're re-exciting those electrons. So just to help you picture this a little bit better, there's a little bit of a level diagram here where you've got your valence band and kind of in that first step, the radiation that the dosimeter is exposed to, that radiation will excite that electron from the valence band all the way up to the conduction band. Okay, that electron is free to move within the conduction band and it will move somewhere within the conduction band until it gets close to one of these trap levels where a dopant atom happens to be. So the electron has to move within the material until it gets close to a dopant. And then it falls into this trap level. This is that second step. And in that trap level, it's not allowed to transition. Sorry for that weird abbreviation, but it's not allowed to transition back down to a lower level. Um, that if you've taken physical chemistry, it's typically because of the state where that trap is, like it might be something like a triplet level versus a singlet level. And there's stuff going on there in terms of allowed transitions and everything. I believe you guys will talk a little bit more about allowed transitions in terms of nuclear decay when you guys do the nuclear structure. Um, in two weeks, I think. Um, so from that trapped level, that electron is there in three, and it can be excited back up into the conduction band, and then it can finally come back down and recombine with a hole in the lower level, somewhere in the valence band, somewhere below that Fermi level, that's that dashed line kind of along the halfway point. And that light again comes out, photon is released, it's higher energy in four than the energy of light that it took to excite the electron in three, okay? And so again, you can tune this so that you're only exciting those trapped electrons and you're not exciting everything that's in the material. And you can turn this into a signal, okay? So this kind of ends our stuff with scintillation. Any questions? So far, anything you want to clear up about scintillation or these luminescent detect dosimeters, which are really a type of detector, they're just a time delayed detector. So they're an offline detector as opposed to an online detector. So is there, um, I guess there's some point where you can't really trap any more electrons? Yeah, you could certainly saturate the material with dose. And um, you would choose your type of dosimeter or you would choose your collection schedule. Um, if you're getting that much dose where these dosimeters don't work for you, you would probably be uh, using a slightly different style of dosimeter that can be read more instantaneously because um, then there's regulations to help control how much radiation you're actually exposed to. So if you're saturating a TLD, over a three month period, you're probably in a situation where um, your employer is going to try to limit the work you do because you're being exposed to too much radiation and they don't want to go over those legal limits for um, occupational exposure. Okay. So, in the um, case that you did saturate it, there'd be no way to know how much radiation you, you're just, it would just be like your lower limit of what it you would be would. like. You got at least this much. And so then, yeah, then there would be issues. So um, they would either try to collect more often or you would have something else. They also make dosimeters that are ionization chambers, basically, that look like pens that you could stick in your pocket protector. And um, 
you would look at that like before and after and there's a way to reset those so you could go in and work for an hour and then you could read that to see exactly how much dose you received or they would do a calculation from that so it's a good question mm -hmm. um and this actually is also even related to say like radiation damage of materials so whenever radiation is interacting with materials if it's depositing energy and we're measuring that energy then we think of that as a good thing because we could use that material as a detector. But if it's depositing energy and it's creating defects in the material, making it more brittle, then that might be an, uh, an issue, let's say with something like stainless steel in a nuclear reactor, okay? So um, two sides of the same coin, anytime radiation deposits energy, it's good if you're trying to measure the energy and it's bad if it's damaging the material and making the material weaker. So kind of moving into semiconductors, then we see a lot of the same kinds of stuff happening with semiconductors as we saw with scintillators. And that's why I spent time going over the, the band structure with the scintillators. So why convert to light and then back to electrons again? Every time you convert between types of energy, you've got some losses because of efficiency, right? When you burn fuel in your car, to turn that into heat energy that then gets turned into like expansion energy of gases that then gets turned into mechanical energy to move your car. Each of those steps, there's losses of energy, right? Does anybody off the top of their head know what like the theoretical efficiency is for a, a heat engine, like an internal combustion engine? Like 10%? Close. I think it's more like 30. The 10 might include some other energy losses, but it's certainly nowhere near 100%, right? So you're only going to get a fraction of the energy out. And if you're converting your radiation to light, first you actually convert your energy to electrons, and then to light, and then back to electrons again. So you've got all these steps with a scintillator detector where you could have energy loss, or you have the introduction of uncertainty. And we'll talk a little bit about the uncertainty on another slide. So why go through all those steps? Why not just let the radiation convert to electrons directly, like with, a, say, a Geiger counter? Well, remember, with a Geiger counter, at least, you get a complete discharge of that Geiger tube anytime any radiation uh, enters it. So a Geiger counter on its own wouldn't be good enough, but the idea of letting that radiation go directly to electrons and then collect those electrons is how semiconductors work. So they have better efficiency um, in terms of the energy conversion, they have better uncertainty in that they have a much lower uncertainty because you have less energy loss along the way. And so when radiation comes into a semiconductor, we're still talking about that radiation interacting with electrons that are in our valence band. Those valence band electrons get excited into the conduction band. And then if you've got a potential applied across your semiconductor, then you can collect those electron hole pairs in the conduction band. And again, you can integrate that charge, turn it into a current or a potential, and you can use that to produce your spectra or count your number of events. So to show you the typical band gaps again, now these have all been translated into electron volts so that we can compare them a little bit better with, um, with the radiation that we're looking for, looking at. So N-type semiconductor, P-type semiconductor, you can see those are very small. They're um, on the order of hundredths of an electron volt, okay? Hyperpure germanium is 0.67 electron volts per um, ionized electron. Pure silicon, 1.10 electron volts, okay? And sodium iodide thallium, doped with thallium, for instance, there. I'm not showing you that band gap, but the amount of energy it actually takes to create an electron ion pair is 26 electron volts. In practice, these band gaps, um, you've got issues with electron recombination with the holes. If you don't give the electrons enough energy to stay in the conduction band, and you have um, changes within the electron bands and the uh, population of the levels at different temperatures. 
And so germanium detectors require liquid nitrogen to operate. So at 77 Kelvin, it's just less than three electron volts to actually create an ion pair that where you can actually collect the electron and turn that into a signal. For silicon at room temperature, it's 3.76 electron volts. So silicon detectors could be operated at room temperature. Sometimes they're still cooled. Hyperpure germanium detectors must be cooled. Um, otherwise, when they rise to room temperature, there's just too much uh, thermal promotion, like from a Boltzmann distribution of the electrons. There's too much thermal promotion of electrons into that conduction band. So I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. When we put an electron into the conduction band, is it like effectively ionized? Is that, is that what's happening? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, if it's only in germanium, let's say, if it's only these band gaps also, just to clarify, the band gaps themselves, so the 0 0.67 eV is the band gap at zero Kelvin. That's where these band gaps come from, okay? So as you increase the temperature, that band gap can change. Um, so then, exactly, you're, this is the energy that it takes to ionize an electron from the valence band to the conduction band for each of these materials. So to compare these materials, to compare sodium iodide doped with thallium, which is our scintillating detector, to something like hyperpure germanium, which is gonna be our semiconductor detector. Let's say you have a 1260 keV gamma ray, and that comes in and we assume it interacts with germanium and we assume it interacts with the sodium iodide and thallium. How many ion pairs, how many electron hole pairs will you create in each detector from that 1260 keV? Would this be at room temperature or the This is at the two, the EV per ion pair that are quoted. So for the germanium, we want to use it at 77 Kelvin. Okay. And the sodium iodide, that one is at room temperature. That one we don't have to cool. For the hyperpure germanium, I'm getting 425,675. Mm-hmm. The other one, I got 48,461. That's it. If we assume this is kind of a statistical process, just like radioactive decay, what simplification could we make for the uncertainties on these numbers? How do you determine the uncertainty on a, radio, a count of activity? What do you do? You take the number of counts and you... Standard deviations is the square root. Take, just take the square root of the number of counts. So what would the uncertainty be now for the number of electron pairs from the germanium? what would the uncertainty be for the sodium iodide, absolute and relative? What was the second part of that question? Sorry. What would the absolute and relative uncertainties be for both of these numbers of electron hole pairs? Mm 
Do we know what the uncertainty is and for the values in brackets? Uh, don't worry about uncertainty on the temperature. We're not doing them all. It, we're just saying that's the energy, that's the ionization energy at those temperatures. And those are the temperatures where we would typically operate those detectors. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So it's question. the uncertainty in the number of um, electrons created or ions created. Yeah, question. Yeah. Um, so was this, this hyperpure germanium detector, the one with the giant door under it? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Have you guys seen one of those uh, in reality in the lab yet or? Uh, so we, virtually. We virtually. saw pictures, yeah. They did a tour or? It was our week zero lab videos. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Yeah, and then I put a picture of it. Um, there's a diagram at the start of these up there, that kind of cutaway diagram that looks like it's black and white at the top right. That doesn't quite show the whole doer, but that's what a hyper pure germanium detector would look like in terms of the setup and the cutaway. Those are like, they were really, really expensive, right? They're pretty expensive and we'll talk about that when we talk about choosing detectors for sure. So your uncertainties, what'd you get here for uncertainties, absolute and relative? Uh, for hyperpure germanium, the absolute is 652 counts. That's it, and 0.15%. And the sodium iodide is? 220. 220. And about 0.45%. To so get relative, saying, are you just dividing the standard deviation by the number of counts? Of right. Thank you. That's it. So you say to yourself, hey, those don't look too bad. You know, they're pretty close together in terms of overall relative uncertainty. So why would you, as somebody said, why would you spend all that extra money for the germanium? Well, is this going to be our overall uncertainty at the end of the day on our measurement? Right, got to propagate it. Right, so the number of electrons we produce with the germanium will pretty much be the number of electrons that we collect. There might be a little small difference there. There might be a little bit of an extra uncertainty that comes into play. But what's going to happen with all those electrons that are created in the sodium iodide? they fall back down and make light? They got to fall back down and make light, right? Are they all going to fall back down and make light? Or are some of them going to undergo non-radiative relaxations? Yeah. Some are going to lose energy in other ways. They're not all going to emit light. So that's going to make the number then that do emit light smaller, which is going to make the relative uncertainty larger. Or you've got another energy transfer step there to think about that introduces more uncertainty. And then the light has to do what in the sodium iodide? It has to interact with the How are you measuring that light from a scintillator detector? Multiplier tube. Photomultiplier tube. So that light has to interact with the photocathode. All of that light isn't necessarily going to get there or interact and eject electrons. We hope it does. But even the light that ejects electrons, there's going to be uncertainty in the number of electrons that are ejected. There's going to be uncertainty in the number of electrons that are produced at each stage of multiplication in the photomultiplier tube. So in the long run, you're going to end up having a much larger uncertainty with the sodium iodide, which is one of the reasons why it has a pretty large uh, resolution relative to hyperpure germanium. I think I've got figures in here and I can show you what the spectra from each one looks like, okay? So the advantages of semiconductors, they're very small, that's great. You can actually choose or make the thickness of your semiconductor to match your application. So if you're just trying to measure x-rays, 
Um, it, the next chapter that we're kind of skipping over, the nuclear analytical methods, one of the methods they talk about in there is PIXI, which is photo ionization X-ray electrons. Um, I think, I think that's what it stands for. And if you're trying to measure the electrons that come out, or if you're trying to measure the X-rays that come out, then you can use a very thin detector for that kind of an experiment. You don't have to have a thick detector because the, ra the, the ranges of the electrons and the gamma rays, low energy gamma rays or X-rays would be small. But if you're working with high energy gamma rays, then you're gonna need a much larger volume of detector. So you can match your thickness. You can buy exactly what you need for what you're doing. Because it's a semiconductor, um, it's got very fast timing characteristics and uh, silicon can operate at room temperature and we can modify these to dope them using either boron ion implantation or gold oxide deposition. So that's really easy to do. It's really easy to make our different types of semiconductors when we want to use them. Some of the disadvantages are that hyperpure germanium or germanium doped with lithium, if those are the semiconductors you're using, you have to operate those at cryogenic temperatures. You actually cannot ever let a germanium lithium detector warm up. If you do, it's dead. The lithium will actually diffuse back out of the detector at room temperatures. Um, overall, these detectors have lower intrinsic efficiency than the sodium iodide. With the sodium iodide dipped with thallium, the gamma rays are able to interact with that high Z iodine that's in the crystal, okay? But when the gamma rays come into germanium, germanium has a much lower atomic number. So our efficiency for photoelectric conversion or even for Compton scattering is much smaller. So if you're trying to have the same efficiency for detection, then that means you have to have very large germanium crystals. Um, they're higher cost also for just efficiency in general. You, as a rule of thumb, you used to be able to take the percentage efficiency that you wanted and multiply that by $1,000. And that was the cost of just the crystal. So remember sodium iodide, thallium, the kind of standard for that, we, I think we said was about 6% um, efficiency. So if you wanted a 6% efficiency hyperpure germanium detector, just the crystal itself would cost you $6,000. And then you've got to add on all of the other costs for the electronics. So how do we make semiconductor detectors work? So if we understand kind of a little bit about how the radiation is generating these electrons in the conduction band, um, we can show a little bit of the math here. The I have band a question about the last slide. Yeah. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> I, I don't quite understand the difference between absolute and intrinsic efficiency yet. Could you explain that? So intrinsic efficiency is assuming that the radiation gets into the detector. So if a gamma ray comes into a sodium iodide doped with thallium detector, where did we put that? Uh, that was resolution, six was resolution, eight was efficiency. So, um, And I said they're absolute, but um, that's also incorporating a little bit of the intrinsic efficiency too. So the assumption with the intrinsic efficiency is that the radiation gets into the detector. How likely now is it to interact? In a Geiger counter, if the radiation gets into the detector, it's going to interact. It's going to cause ionization and an avalanche and a cascade and your Geiger counter to pick that up as a count, okay? But the gamma rays, for instance, have a longer range. So when they enter your detector, there's always a possibility they might pass straight through. So this is kind of going to, back to our mu or our mass attenuation coefficient. Um, and the higher the Z, the more likely the photoelectric effect is to occur. The higher the Z, the more likely pair production is to occur. In general, the higher the Z of the material, the more likely that gamma ray is to interact with it, okay? And the bigger the volume of the material, the more likely it is to interact with it. 
that's intrinsic efficiency. Now, because you hardly ever have your sample directly in your detector, liquid scintillation is the one kind of exception to that, your detector always sits somewhere typically above your sample. And if your sample is a point source and your detector is a circle, then you take the distance between the point and the circular detector and that represents the radius of a circle, a sphere, and you can model that circular area of the detector as a portion of the surface area of the sphere. And the radiation that comes out from your sample can come out in all directions. It comes out isotropically, and only a portion is actually gonna make it to the detector. So this okay. is commonly discussed as say like the inverse square law, and the analogy I always used was a flashlight. You shine a flashlight on a wall, and when you're up close to the wall, that flashlight is very intense and very bright, right? And if you drew a, that circle on the wall and you measured how much of the light was getting into that circle and then you backed up from the wall with your flashlight, the light on the wall would get bigger and there would be less light making it into that original circle that you drew, right? So say if, um, so if we knew the, that 100% of the radiation was collected just hypothetically, would that absolutely an intrinsic be equal? Yeah, so that would be a 100% um, absolute efficiency based off geometry, I think. I think absolute's the right word. But just because it gets into the detector doesn't mean it's going to interact with the detector. So okay. That, that depends on the type of detector and it depends on the type of radiation. Got it, thank you so much. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. One of my end slides is kind of comparing these detectors and talking about when you would choose each one based off of what you want to measure. So the band structures, just to emphasize this again, I mentioned it on an earlier slide, but the band structures, the band gaps, these are all typically calculated at zero Kelvin. And if you want to know how many electrons or how many uh, charge carriers are actually present in the material, you can use that equation there for P at temperature T. You should notice it's got Boltzmann's constant in there. It's got temperature to the three halves. Gee, that kind of looks like a Boltzmann distribution, okay? And it is based on a Boltzmann distribution for the charge carriers and whatever your material is. The band gap there, the smaller the band gap, the larger that E exponent term is going to be, and so the more charge carriers are going to have, okay? For silicon, um, where the band gap is 1.11 electron volts, we typically don't have to cool these detectors to use silicon semiconductors to detect ions, but if you were trying to use silicon semiconductors to do electron or X-ray spectroscopy, um, because that's so much lower energy for the radiation, you typically do cool your detectors then. That's more to improve your uncertainties than it is to um, make it possible to do it. But with germanium, where the band gap is less than one electron volt, um, you basically can't use it as a detector unless it's being cooled. Otherwise, it would seem like it's always responding. So thermal excitation in general, or energy deposition from radiation can create these electron hole pairs. These behave just like ion pairs and gases. The electrons and the holes can both move in an electric field. Unlike in gases, the charge carriers here, the electrons and the holes, both move at the same speed in solids, unlike in gases. So in gases, it was an electron that was moving and a charged cation that was moving. In semiconductors or in solids here, the electrons are still electrons. They still move pretty quickly. And the holes are actually where the electron is missing from. And it's not that the hole itself moves, it's that other electrons move in to fill that hole. So because it's still electrons moving to fill the hole and that makes the hole move, the hole, that's why the holes and the electrons in these ion pairs move at about the same speed in the solids. The product, the total, your, your product of um, positive and negative charge carriers, your, the product of your electrons and your holes always has to be a constant. So you might have an electron rich material, which is gonna mean you've got more electron charge carriers in that material, 
that means you're going to have fewer holes, but that product always has to come out as a constant. So it's kind of like pressure times volume in gas laws. Okay. Um, that, the total number, the absolute number of charge carriers in intrinsic semiconductors. So in silicon, that's about 9 billion per cubic centimeter. And in germanium, that's the 1.79 times 10 to the 13th per cubic centimeter. And both of those are at room temperature. So when you've got 10 to the 13th charge carriers, at room temperature for germanium, that's one of the reasons why we can't use it at room temperature. It has to be cooled, okay? Um, the speed of these charge carriers equals the mobility, the mu, times epsilon, the electric field at low fields, and their speeds saturate at higher fields. So the maximum speed they can move at is about 10 to the seventh centimeters per second, okay? So what that means is that in semiconductors, even though there's some time associated with their mo movement, that's why the dead time for semiconductors is so small, because these electrons and holes can move so fast, okay? Questions on this slide? I'm not gonna ask you to do any of these equations. I'm just showing you why there are so many electron ion hole pairs in something like germanium at room temperature. So I have, I have a question. Yeah. What is it, like what property of the material is causing um, the P times N to have to be constant? Um, that is, um, that's a good question. What property of the material that is just a, um, it's a rule with these semiconductors, that no matter how many electrons you have or how many holes you have, when you have these electron hole pairs, that product has to be constant. Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll look into that to try and see if I can't figure out why that is. I think that, I mean, it comes from, I'm pretty sure it comes from modeling the, um, numbers present at different temperatures. There are some equations for that. I have to find where they are. I can look that up for you. Um, the C in that equation is just some constant that depends on the material as well. So you got, that's why you guys don't have to do the equation. I'm just showing you in general that the smaller the band gap, the more pairs you'd have, the more charge carriers, and the higher the temperature the more charge carriers, okay? Yeah, all right, so active regions. So um, in these intrinsic semiconductors, we have a relatively small number of charge carriers, which is one of the reasons why we dope them. If we dope them with electron rich or electron poor, then we suddenly now have a very large number of either electron charge carriers or a very large number of hole charge carriers. Because intrinsic semiconductors have low numbers of charge carriers, they have low conductivity, um, and the high rate of linear energy transfer, our DEDX, our linear rate of um, energy loss, because it's a solid material, that high LET means you're generating lots of ion pairs close to each other, which means that a lot of them can recombine. So intrinsic semiconductors actually have poor performance as radiation detectors. Um, for an N-type, the density of charge carriers is um, equal to this one over E N sub D mu E, this is like mobility of the electrons. This is like the number of your um, dopant atoms. We're not gonna do anything with that equation, okay? Just pointing out that for an N type semiconductor, your number of electrons over holes is gonna be greater than one. And for a P type, it has a very similar equation to that shown in the N type, but basically the number of holes over electrons is greater than one. You have a lot more missing electrons, okay? When you have these two different materials and you put them together, 
So this is the PN junction in a semiconductor detector. This PN junction is known as a diode. How many people have done anything with diodes in physics? Circuits or electronics? No hands. Yeah, but I didn't know what I was doing, so. Didn't know what you were doing. This will talk a little bit about it, okay? If you put the PN junction here, you can minimize leakage currents and improve sensitivity in your det detectors. So how does this work? If you have a P-type semiconductor, so the P-type semiconductor is on the right side of this line, okay? A P-type semiconductor, remember, is gonna be electron poor. It's gonna have holes. So our Na here, or our P here represents our number of holes in the P-type semiconductor. Our ND here represents our number of um, electrons in our N-type semiconductor. If we put those two materials together, if they are now in electrical contact, okay, then you've got electron, extra electrons on one side, you've got extra holes on the other side. What do you think is going to happen to those electrons and holes? Pair up. They're going to try to pair up, so they're going to migrate. So you're going to have electrons from the N-type semiconductor that migrate into the P-type semiconductor, and you're going to have some holes from the P-type semiconductor that migrate into the N-type semiconductor. This is without us doing anything other than just putting the two materials together, okay? So then the dashed lines there represent the actual amounts of the electrons and the holes at different distances in those materials as they get closer to that junction, okay? Naturally, which way are electrons going to want to flow in this junction? They want to go down to lose energy. They're going to want to flow towards where? Go downwards. Like as downwards in down a, down right a hill of energy. Left. So they want to go towards the P-type semiconductor or away from the P-type semiconductor? Towards. Towards, okay. And so if that would be considered to be normal potential. So if you put a normal potential across this junction, and you make the P-type semiconductor, if you make that more positive, and you make the N-type semiconductor more negative, then that's the potential where current would flow. And that makes this P-N junction a diode. Maybe you recall hearing that a diode only allows current to flow in one direction. That would be why, because that's the natural direction where the electrons wanna flow, right? If you reverse that potential, if you put a negative potential on the n-type side, no wait, that would be wrong. If you put a positive potential on the n-type side and a negative potential on the p-type side, then you're gonna push those electrons back into the n-type side, right? And you're gonna push those holes back into the p-type side when they were first contacted. But now that you've put that potential across, is current going to naturally flow still in that direction? No, it's going to go the opposite. It would go the opposite if it could, but there's not going to be enough charge carriers for it to do that. So that's called the reversed bias junction. And if you put the reverse the potential on a diode, which is a PN junction, that's why current doesn't flow. So is that still a diode or is that called something else? It would still be a diode, but specifically now when we have this PN junction for radiation, we're gonna call it a semiconductor detector, okay? So diodes are semiconductors. So this is what it looks like. If there's no bias on that junction, you can look at the space charge, you can look at the concentration of holes, you can look at the concentration of the electrons. You can look at the physical potential, okay? And when you put a reverse bias on this, you can um, flatten that potential back out.
yeah, yeah. So here's the next meme. When you apply that potential bias that's reversed and you move all of those electrons and all of those holes back to the semiconductor types where they originally came from when we contacted the materials, what you're doing in that in-between region where you're applying that reverse bias is you are depleting it of charge carriers, okay? You are basically taking away the extra electrons from the n-type semiconductor. You're taking away the extra holes from the p-type semiconductor so that you're making the number of charge carriers extremely small. That means no current can be conducted. We call that region where we've depleted it of charge carriers, we call that the depletion layer. So that made me think about the car salesman meme. So these are just a few of the equations that apply to this. The potential that you apply, this V for full depletion, is related to E, the, the fundamental unit of charge, N, the number of charge carriers, T, the temperature, okay? Epsilon is the permittivity, the electric permittivity of the material. This W is the width or the thickness of the depletion layer. It's related to this row term. Again, that remember that was just like the density of your charge carriers. The V is the applied potential. And the C again is just gonna be some sort of a constant that's related to the material. So the picture here, this is a typical um, surface barrier detector where you've put some sort of a layer. This, that's the N-type layer at the very top. It's extremely thin. It doesn't have to be a very thick um, layer for this doped semiconductor. This N-type, this would be um, electron rich. So um, that might be like a... I think that might be like a gold oxide layer. I think the oxygen might be increasing the number of electron carriers there. Oxygen would be electron rich compared to silicon. And the p-type there, that would be some sort of bulk material silicon that you tried to get kind of pure but couldn't get super pure and so you know it's got some extra um, hole carriers or electron poor doped materials in there, okay? And when you apply a reverse bias, you're able to extend that depletion region to some depth within the detector. So at the top, where that n-type layer is, down to where that dashed line is, that whole physical region in that space, that is now the region that's sensitive to radiation. And if some sort of radiation comes in and interacts and creates more electron hole pairs, those electron hole pairs are immediately going to move because now you've created more charge carriers. Now those charge carriers can move and will be collected, okay? But this is basically a diode, so there's no current normally passing through because you've depleted all of the charge carriers. As soon as you create charge carriers when radiation comes in and interacts, now all of a sudden you're able to collect all of that. Now you're able to get a signal from your detector, okay? If you crank your voltage up too high, you can have what's known as breakthrough current um, or breakdown current. That's a bad thing. Um, and there is always, of course, electronic noise, and we'll talk about some of that as well. Um, yeah, I've got notes here. Um, yeah, the C is, uh, is resistivity, and that is material dependent. Typically, it's between three and five times 10 to the negative fifth centimeters as a constant, but you're not gonna do calculations with these. I'm just including the equations with this, okay? I have a question. Uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Andrew. Okay, so why is the depletion layer only in the p-type and not in the n-type? It does extend into the n-type as well. It's just that that n-type layer is so thin that the whole n-type layer is already depleted. Oh, okay. Okay, so the dashed line, is showing you kind of the absolute, oh, I see what you mean there. Um, yeah, I mean, it might just be that that bracket's a little bit off. The depletion layer is gonna extend into both, 
but maybe because the end type layer is so thin, the whole end type layer isn't depleted. Like if we go back to this slide, that end type layer that might be so electron rich that you can't pull all of the electrons out of it. But in practice, we pretty much ignore the end type layer when we think about the, the depletion region because it's so thin. Basically, almost nothing's actually going to interact in that layer to begin with. Good question, though. So the question I had was, why, why is it that electron pairs become depleted whenever you put a reverse bias? Is it just because you're separating the two like so, the holes in the electrons? Yeah, so keeping in mind that your P-type layer has extra holes and your N-type layer has extra electrons. So if you put a reverse bias on that so that you pull all the electrons out of the N-type and all the holes out of the P-type, or as many as you can, then you've got a region in that detector that is depleted of charge carriers, where there are no extra um, electrons, no extra holes. Now that region, the product still has to be the same. You still have electrons, you still have holes, okay? It's just that it's, the amount of them is so small that any current flow is really super tiny, so. <laughs> Yeah, very descriptive words, right? Super precise. So I had already backed up to show you guys this picture, but um, just to kind of blow it up a little bit more, you've got this cold finger that extends down into the liquid nitrogen doer and that comes up and then connects to the germanium detector to keep the germanium detector cool. And you don't want condensation or anything else like that in there. Um, so you've got these things like charcoal packs to help collect and um, try to limit the amount of moisture that can get in. The whole germanium detector itself is wrapped in a can, this end cap kind of thing. Um, usually that's aluminum. Um, the germanium crystal, it, crystal itself inside of that can is then also kind of um, electroplated to create your uh, con electrical contacts for your depletions and everything. There's a pin there in the center. And so really what the germanium detector ends up being is it doesn't look like this figure, which would be like a surface barrier detector for say doing alpha spectroscopy, um, but it is kind of like a radial detector where the electron hole pairs are gonna migrate in towards the pin and out towards the edge of the crystal, okay? Um, yeah. Let's take a break now before we finish up detectors with radiochromic materials. So how about being back by about 12.05?